run a tight schedule so that uh, we gain some of the time that has been utilized by others. Uh, I think that would be possible, taking into account the, the previous panel that I was able to uh, listen to, took half of its time with private equity. So I think they've covered most of our, uh, of our, of our points. And my fellow panelists, uh, being most of them private equity driven, they do know it's an interesting time for them, one way or another. Uh, Nikos Bornozis, which I thank for inviting all of us, has asked me not to give any great introduction. I will not follow him. Uh, I have next to me Kostas Karayanis. Kostas Karayanis uh, works for Apollo Management. I, I think as a name, we all know Apollo. It's a true private equity firm, has invested in a number of things, some of them which is unrelated to shipping altogether, whether that's Caesars or, or other entities. But uh, if I recall correctly, Norwegian Cruise Line that's is right. one of your uh, uh, investments. And a JV with Rickmers. And a JV with Rickmers. And uh, Costas has 23 years in the business, so he, he knows what he, he wants. He also doesn't want to answer some of the questions I want to put, but I'll, I'll deal with this. And then next, next to line is uh, Nino Mowingil, uh, who is, uh, I would say, more in credit rather than in private equity. Uh, I think private equity tends to be a misnomer. People, uh, if we read the two words, it's private equity, but it's not necessarily private equity. So in the case of Apollo, it could be public funds that are used in private equity or real estate or other things. Uh, in the case of Nino, uh, Breakwater Capital is pretty much a lender. But I suspect in uh, the traditional uh, sense, it's not a lender. It's more like investing either in uh, giving loans or in uh, buying loans. Uh, Nino came from a bank and ended up to Delphine Shipping, which was a private equity, a true private equity deal with Kelso and a Greek New York uh, uh, ship owner. And he has, of course, the PE experience to tell us how credit will, uh, will fit into this picture. Paolo Almeida is probably, I should say, one which is closest to shipping. He studied as a naval uh, architect. Uh, back in 1995, I assume he doesn't remember much anymore. He then, he then moved to a shipping company. He then moved to UBS and Macquarie. He did a lot of, uh, if I recall, I was younger than uh, IPOs of shipping companies. He's, he's done a few. And then he moved into Tufton, which he still is. And Tufton Oceanic is a well-known um, investment boutique, as far as I am concerned, but which managed to have private equity funds to invest in shipping, and they have done so. And last uh, but not least is uh, uh, a person that I, once I called Andy Garcia, and they thought he was the actor, but it's uh, Andrew Garcia, who used to be in PE. He still has a PE, uh, PE hat in mind, and, uh, and, uh, but he works for Brentwood Shipping and Trading, which is a, the private arm of a well-known ship owner. But he does, he is there, he's the president of this company, he's there to look more as an operating investor, but also as a financial investor. So therefore, I think he has thing to tell, things to tell us. With that in mind, I, I, would, I would like to pose the first question to all four participants. I think that's a good way of getting a feeling what they think. And um, I was told that, you know, uh, 2006, 2015 finished with a bumpy ride, and 2016 has started even bumpier. And I think the question that um, all my or most of my uh, colleagues wanted to be asked is, uh, how do they see? What do they see? And I will start with Nino, uh, Mo Winkle, who is in the credit side of things. How do they see the the key theme? The key themes. Uh, what, do you, what key themes do you see driving uh, yeah. driving uh, investors investor sentiment? So just to start off with, um, for those of you who are not already aware, Breakwater Capital is a lending company. We are a lending platform. We are exclusively focused on the shipping industry. Um, we focus typically on ticket sizes of 20 to 150 million US. 
We are sector agnostic across all of the major um, uh, shipping verticals, so dry, wet, uh, clean, dirty, container, offshore, rig assets, offshore supply vessels, even though we're not doing a tremendous amount of activity in that sector right now. Um, we recently closed several transactions for north of 100 million US. We are active, we are looking to partner with owners. We market ourselves as asset lenders. We really don't focus on the credit, we don't focus on the corporate. Our belief is that if you get the ships wrong, by and large, you're going to get the company wrong. Um, everybody on the team has a shipping background, whether that be from banking, lending, private equity, or ship owning. I think that in this environment, it is incredibly challenging. Last year, we processed approximately $10 billion worth of transactions, and I can tell you that we didn't close anywhere near that number. You have to kiss a lot of frogs until one turns into a princess. Uh, it is resource intensive, uh, but I would say that the right deals do get done and should get done. I think that owners deserve access to capital. I think that the question that was posed at the end of the last panel is an incredibly challenging question, that what does the small marginal owner do now that the banks are really focused on geographic, regional lending, name lending, big corporate credit lending, and I would say that for the right owners, the capital should be available. Um, to answer the question, it's a difficult environment, and I think that the fundamentals are actually disproportionate to the negative sentiment. I think that we're in an environment where we are growing. We're growing at X percent, whether that's two or three, we don't know, but we are growing. Uh, the population is growing. Trade growth continues to expand. And yet, I feel that everybody is remarkably pessimistic. I was in Germany recently, uh, two weeks ago, and actually today, it has been much more positive than, than, than my trip to Hamburg was. And I think that that's emblematic of the Greek entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so I think that we need to muddle through, and the right deals will get done. You were talking mainly about credit, deal, credit deals so from your side. So I will move to Paolo. And, and try and find out, you know, where is the equity that some owners want rather than debt? Well, um, as, with, as with credit and as with um, most of shipping generally, um, not too many deals um, uh, are getting done. There's a uh, fairly high bid-ask spread um, on most types of assets. Um, last year, we acquired 11 ships for um, three different funds that we were investing from, um, one of which fin we finished investing um, late last year and two of which we started investing in the middle, the middle of last year. Um, a mix of bulkers, we put very little capital to work in bulkers over the past couple of years. We've been acquiring uh, chemical tankers, a couple of Suez Maxes, and container ships that have charter coverage. And each of those deals, um, you know, took took quite a lot of time. We put nearly two hundred million dollars to work, um, and over the past few years, we put twenty five. Uh, we've bought twenty five ships, put about five hundred and fifty million dollars uh, to work, and each each deal has had its, um, has had its challenges. Um, I think we probably expect to invest in roughly the same sectors this year. We plan to put more into tankers. Uh, we plan to invest into container ships on a ship-by-ship -ship basis um, where there is some coverage or some visibility of, of earnings perhaps by putting the ship into a good pool. Um, and we may start acquiring bulkers as well. We've been acquiring, and one key thing, uh, especially to do bulkers but also for container ships and even, even tankers on the spot market, we've been acquiring vessels um, on an unlevered basis um, for um, a group of European pension funds who like the exposure to an asset class that they haven't had exposure to before um, that is generally cash flow generative um, and where asset prices of course may go down um, but are quite attractive um, on uh, uh, quite a number of, of, of ways to look at it based on uh, looking at it versus history. So that's, that's, that's how we're looking at 
at the space. Um, we're, we're definitely not looking for any IPO exits. Um, don't need to repeat what the guys said earlier, but um, it's going to be a long time before there are any IPO exits that will keep other types of capital out of shipping because they need an exit. Um, people that don't need an exit are the ones that are going to benefit from the current conditions, we think. I'll move to Andrew. And since you've touched on exits, uh, Andrew, you're now with Brentwood, but what do you see the exit strategy of the funds which are already placed in shipping being in the short term, um, you know, six to 18 months? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, so I, I recently joined Brentwood, which, as you mentioned, is the um, private holding company of a well-known uh, ship owner. Um, and the reason I joined them is I spent the last, six, uh, the last nine years um, sitting in the seat at uh, Pine River Capital Markets, uh, Pine River, where I ran the capital market strategy. And we were one of the two or three largest IPO investors in shipping companies over the, that nine-year period. Um, and as you look at the historic strategy of institutional investors and private equity investors, it became apparent that investors with a, a timeline or, or, or a, a need for a terminal exit are not the right capital structure for investing in these types of assets. You, they need to be owned by people who can have the ability to ha and the flexibility to both be opportunistic depending on how the cycle acts, but also be patient and, and underwrite an individual asset to an, ex to an expected return over a cycle. Um, I do think that we are, especially in dry bulk, looking at a longer recovery than most people think. Um, one of the other spaces that we were very involved with at Pine River was the, the mortgage market in the United States, which shows a lot of similar attributes to what we see in shipping finance today. And what we haven't seen yet, which is what we needed to see before we saw a recovery in the U.S. financial markets, was an acceptance by the banks and by the lenders that there needed to be a cleansing and turnover of the assets of the books. And in order to do that, we needed to find the right price for assets so that owners could establish a cost basis that would allow them to own and operate these ships in, in a normal new go forward environment. What I do think is the opportunity ahead of us is that while we haven't seen it, we're getting very close to that period of time when we're gonna start to see through the acts of regulators, through the acts of banks, a need for that changeover to happen and that you know, patient investors that are willing to underwrite risk will be able to work and partner with operators and owners to, to um, accumulate portfolios of ships that will be, will be a good portfolio to own over the long term. And that was, that was the view of, of Brentwood when we decided that we wanted to both focus with our own commercial and technical operations and helping work with other owners to grow scale and grow assets in that space as well as work with owners in other asset classes by partnering with people. So we bring sort of a unique view in that we both are willing to work as an operating partner for financial investors as well as a capital partner for operators in other spaces. Um, but you know, as I said, what I think we need to see before we have a recovery is turnover in, in the credit in a freeing of this locked market where we don't have to, where we don't have buyers and sellers meeting at a price, so that we can start to get beyond this stalemate and move and move forward. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'll ask Costas, who works for Apollo. Uh, I think Andrew described a, a partner who is opportunistic but has a long-term view. I, I think these sometimes are very contradictory terms. But in any event, you being at Apollo and having made all these investments, when you apply your strategy, whether it's shipping, real estate, loans, do you follow the same parameters or, or do you differentiate depending what the, what the industry is? Well, thank you. <clears throat> I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all strategy. So um, we basically look at economic opportunity when it arises and we customize, we can be very creative in terms of transaction structuring. 
So you have different outfits for, for real estate, different outfits for shipping, different outfits for, for non-performing loans. Having said that, um, Apollo may be well known for its private equity arm, which is currently 60 billion, but in fact, we're larger on the credit side, where we manage 120 uh, billion. So it's, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of movement from the PE side to the credit side and, and, um, uh, and vice versa. Now, speaking of the market, I think there's too many moving parts. <coughs> But the main moving part, and it's actually moving sand, is the deteriorating um, values on, on, of the assets. And you really can't put your finger on it. Just when you think you hit rock bottom, the bottom falls off um, again. So what we did last year, we did a couple of uh, JVs. One was with uh, a Greek ship owner, Primarine, um, whereby, and the other was with MC Capital. So we financed a total of of uh, 12 vessels uh, last year in the form of smaller JVs. It, it's nowhere close the 500 million JV we did with Rickmers. Um, but in fact, the view we took last year was approaching the JV via preferred equity type of uh, transaction, whereby we contributed up to 85% of the equity in a preferred mezzanine-like uh, position, while the contributors um, well, the operators contributed the remainder. Um, and there's a, you know, sharing a, a upside, a residual upside. There's all sorts of uh, mechanisms and triggers uh, to do that. Now, having said that, this year is even more challenging. And, um, you know, direct equity uh, transactions are very, very, very challenging for the aforementioned uh, reasons. So what we're looking at is de-risking the transactions and taking away, moving away from residual uh, value risk. And how do you do that? You do that through transactions that are based on contracted revenue or sale and leaseback um, uh, type of transactions, whereby we focus on, on, on cash flow, we focus on having um, positive carry um, on the cash flows to de-risk the transaction as much as possible, given that the exit, exits are not apparent. Um, you know the IPO market has been shot for this you know, shipping sector for the last uh, for the last few years, uh, and there's no obvious uh, exit. You know you can you can be creative. You can uh, think of M&A. You can uh, think of uh, um, you know uh, trade sales, a sale of assets, or liquidation if need be. Uh, and speaking of of exits, Apollo takes a long-term view. We're looking at a minimum of five years. On occasion, we've done seven uh, to, to 10 years. Our <clears throat> capital commitments are thereabout. Um, so when you enter into an action, you typically think, think of an exit. It doesn't always uh, work out. And in these cases, when you have mismatched exit plans, you need to sort of work out a strategy with, with uh, uh, your partner. Right now, uh, a lot of transactions we're discussing, uh, you know, involved um, repo obligations, repurchase um, uh, uh, obligations. But clearly, even in asset classes like container ships, where you know contractual performance has been very good, the the asset values haven't moved. And in a typical private equity tr uh, transaction, that feel, that kills 50% of the trade. So you go in because you go after the cash flow, but you want the residual upside. We're not seeing that, even in, in asset classes that are performing. So that takes 50% of the return away, and we need to sort of adjust our, our approach accordingly so as to you know, try to de-risk the transaction in favor of our, of our LPs, of, of our own investors. Thank you, Kostas. Credit and funds, private equity funds, uh, Nino, your credit but do you see these things working together? I mean, some people, when they think of private equity, they just think of equity, but some of them, you know, what kind of structures do you see on the credit side that would not look like a loan, but, you know, it will work as equity? So I, I think that when you look at the landscape of alternative ship finance, uh, it's important to focus on patient capital, both Costas and Andrew. Um, uh, use that word, and, and that is crucial both on the equity and the debt side. Um, from Breakwater's perspective, we operate with two pockets of capital. 
one that we refer to as the direct lending fund, and, and that's really going to look and smell a lot like the type of debt that you would receive from a mainstream bank. Uh, it's going to have similar terms, similar covenants, um, but the benefit of working with us is that we're able to be a little bit more flexible in uh, challenging environments. So we're spending a tremendous amount of time working um, with dry bulk owners to put um, to put facilities in place that support them through the next 18, 24 months. Uh, either that's uh, opportunistic acquisitions or refinancing out existing facilities. Uh, the second pocket of capital is what we refer to as the Special Opportunities Fund, and that's where we can have a bit of fun, and that's where we can get a bit more creative and stretch the mandate, where we can look at junior mezzanine sale leasebacks. Uh, and I think that if you're able to combine the two approaches, you're able to provide owners and borrowers and, and, and shipping corporates with something that's fairly unique. Uh, and yes, of course, if you partner with the right sponsor uh, and you have the right patient capital, both equity and debt, then in theory, you should be able to, uh, to ride the cycles. Thanks, Anino. Um, Andrew, you, you, talked, you, you were the first to talk about patient capital. So w when you go to your, now you're not a private equity firm anymore, Principal, you are you are working for the I would call it chip owner, although it's a financial investor. Your guys, as far as I'm aware, but what would you look in your partner that you will be doing some deals as an operating partner and putting some of your equity there? Well, um, a typical example will be a series of investments that we have with a well-known. Um, private equity investor where we act as both a capital partner and an operating partner. And how those transactions work is we invest peri passu 50-50 of the equity and then handle technical and commercial management of the, vassals, of the assets with them. The idea being that we put ourselves alongside them so that we're equally intended both to maximize the commercial performance and minimize the OPEX ex expenses and therefore we feel that we have an interest of alignment. Um, in some cases, our partners on the private equity side, um, and I think this is important because of how we talk about credit versus equity, our partners on the private equity side may choose to lever their returns to some extent to get a, a higher target IRR if that's what their clients look for. Um, and historically, the, the family that I work for has believed that you should have ships, you should have cash, you should have no debt. And the reason is that you know, over the cycle, if you can lower your cost of operating, you're going to be at an advantage to other people, and you're not going to be working for the bank. And as we go into difficult periods like this, I think what is important to think to yourself as you look at buying new assets and who you purchase with is what is the, real, what is the realistic return that you expect to earn on that asset over the cycle? And are you working for yourself as an equity owner of that asset, or are you working for the person who's lending you money, just taking more risk? So what we look to do is we're going to look to work with people where we can put equity alongside with them and help get some synergies and get some scale and try to find opportunities to spread our risk amongst other investors, but also get exposure to assets that we like in a way that we feel that we're commingling that risk. Um, the, the benefit of working in a family structure as opposed to LPs is that while we'd like to be opportunistic and we'd like to maximize the return on an IRR basis, both for our co-investors and for ourselves, we, we really can have ultimate control over how long we're in that investment because we don't have a fund that ends in five years or seven years or ten years. And that gives you an opportunity to live with an investment as long as you think that it's a good use of your capital. I'll ask you now, what kind of ships would you be looking at? I mean, Paolo said that he's looking at tankers, containers. You know, Costa said contracted revenue, so they're all looking, they're all working towards the same, and I'm sure Nino would have said the same, but uh, so what, what ships are you will be looking in 2016? Um, I think right now, personally, my, I'm, I'm most focused on the opportunity that we're seeing in the dry bulk sector and trying to understand what you know, when we see asset values and when we see um, prices that are an attractive entry point for us to, to add exposure in the sectors that we're most interested in, the Cape size, the Supermax, um, to a lesser extent, the Campsar Max and, and post Panamax vessels. Um, the family also has investments in the crude tanker space 
and which we work with operating partners other than ourselves on the commercial and technical management side. Um, we have made investments in the LNG space, and we would be open across other asset classes at looking at opportunities with other operators where we think that we have a mutual alignment of interest and we can benefit from their skills and expertise. Okay. Which reminded me one thing. Um, the previous panel said that there are no LPG investments or LNG investments, but there, there are such investments. There, there are two in Greece as well on the LPG side by uh, quite big investment houses as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Paolo, which I've left to the side. Paolo, your funds, do they have the structure that one needs, you know, this perpetual structure and patient capital structure, if possible, that, you know, investors would be, and would be looking or partners that you may find would be looking so to ride the cycles? Well, <clears throat> we, um, we have a number of structures. Um, we do have a traditional private equity uh, type vehicles that tend to be five, five to seven years, five to seven being um, in the determination of the manager. So we as Tufton determine, um, we can determine to um, exit between five and seven years. After at seven years, however, we can go back to investors with an annual vote or, or even a three yearly vote to extend. So, and we've found, we haven't done it ourselves, but we've found with other people that we've worked with that generally investors are quite happy to extend the life of a fund uh, in the case where the manager makes uh, a good reason for it. Obviously, the reason to extend the fund uh, can't be to continue our fee stream. It has to be in the interest of, of, uh, of investors. And actually, in terms of that fund, we as Tufton are actually the largest investor in the fund with about one quarter of the capital in that fund. So I investors know that we're aligned um, on that. The, the capital that we've been uh, investing over the past two and a half years um, are in um, also th they're in strictly speaking fund structures, but um, each fund only has one investor. Each is a European pension fund. Uh, those funds have a seven to 10 year um, uh, horizon uh, completely in, um, in our discretion uh, is Tufton. And we also have the ability to sell vessels after four or five years and, re and then recycle that capital into new investments. So while strictly speaking, legally, it's not a perpetual uh, vehicle, um, both we and the clients consider it to be a quasi-perpetual uh, vehicle as long as, um, as things continue to go according to expectations. Obviously, if seven years from now we have a 2007-2008 uh, environment, there should be the incentives for um, for us to sell everything, return the money to the investors, and sit and do nothing for three or four years. We'll have to wait for 2007, 2008. But uh, assuming, assuming, uh, and I, I raise a question to Costas. You said you're looking at capital, uh, at contracted revenue. Any other attributes you're looking at your partners w without, of course, focusing on the ones you have, but yeah. w what kind of qualities <laughs> they should expect that you will be looking for? We're fairly um, <clears throat> sector agnostic, so we give emphasis in, in the economic structure of a transaction, and we're not taking views on, on um, asset classes. So we're selecting economic opportunities rather than taking views on, on shipping sectors. Now, having said that, we're still fairly bearish, I have to say, on the dry bulk uh, sector. Um, the far better view, in my opinion, is private equity would always be attracted to high quality uh, projects with experienced high quality owners slash operators, especially in niche areas where there exists some sort of barriers to entry, including the need for, for uh, high technical expertise. Now, what kind of patterns we're looking at? We're looking for partners with whom uh, we can share a common business vision, um, with a good modern fleet, with no legacy issues, partners who will have real skin in the game other than talent and expertise, and whose interests will be completely aligned with ours. <clears throat> that means no side deals outside the JV, no structural conflicts, and so on and so forth. Uh, looking for transparency in operations, no black boxes, and of course, clarity in corporate governance and compliance. So. We usually take an active role 
uh, as PE investors in management. We would like to be consulted uh, and, and involved. And sometimes we do that at levels that you know, ship owners find awkward for effective management as they thrive on you know, fast decision making and, and uh, you know, decisive uh, decisions. And we need to get a bit more granular. After all, we're deploying uh, investors' money. So this becomes sort of awkward, and I, I have to say this up front. So this w would have to be the right <clears throat> frame of mind. You need to be in the right mindset. And we make those things very open since the beginning, and we, you know, we even negotiate on this, on this type of, uh, of uh, um, engagement. I need to ask Nino, like he's on the credit side for sure, but he has his special funds, and uh, how, how is he going to be dealing with uh, stubbornly low asset values, you know, what if the values stay there for the next five years, pinned, you know, revenues may not be the same depending on, from what you've of course chosen, but how do you look the asset values affecting your strategy, if at all? I think that for us as a lender, it's tremendously difficult in the dry side when you have owners coming to you and asking you to finance, uh, especially with resales and, and new builds, asking you to finance cost and not value. And as, as we all know, there's an enormous uh, discrepancy between cost and value given the way the markets have unfolded uh, in the last, uh, really, six months. Um, if you take a look at what happened in Q3, Q4, there was a reset in the secondary market for secondhand tonnage where um, the discrepancy between actual value, which I recognized as sub subjective, but actual value and perceived value was whittled away uh, by the brokers. And, and, and valuations took a leg down in the secondhand market, which was needed to, in theory, attract a little bit of liquidity to the market. That, that happened in a few rare instances from cash buyers. Um, but given the constraints on the debt side, there, there hasn't been the liquidity inflow that I think many of us would have hoped for on the second-hand side. Uh, and that's really been constraining any movement upward in asset prices on the second-hand side. On the new build side, we still haven't seen that leg down. Um, and that's really for several reasons. One, because there haven't been um, a tremendous amount, if any, resale transactions, one. And two, because the yards haven't reset their prices because nobody's ordering ships, because either they lack faith in the forward market or because they're not able to secure the debt financing uh, to order ships. Um, so from a lender's perspective, it is difficult to work with resale transactions. That said, we are processing several. Um, it's just a matter of finding a happy uh, middle ground where the borrower feels comfortable with the advance amount that you're providing them. Um, and on the tanker side, it is what it is. There's not a, not a tremendous amount that we can say. I think, in theory, project yields should benefit from the fact that cash flows have gone up, asset prices have remained relatively stagnant. Uh, I think that w <laughs> what, um, what maybe people are frustrated by is, is that they have paper gains that they're struggling to crystallize on the tanker side, where you have uh, uh, quite a few high-profile investments that have done very, very well on the tanker side. Um, and, and, and people, rightly so, are looking to take some chips off the table and, and, and can't do so. Um, so it's not an e easy environment. There's no right answer. But um, I'd say the answer is to muddle through and, and, and do what you can. We have no more than five minutes or thereabouts. Should I leave that for questions? I mean, in case there are any. Mr. Tsirigakis. And if I were to couple that with the dry bulk uh, uh, situation right now, it would seem to me a, like a contradiction. Would you want contracted revenue uh, or you wouldn't look at dry bulk at all for some time? You're right. It would be, um, it would be a huge paradox. Um, we're not looking at dry bulk. <laughs> <laughs> There are others who are looking at dry bulk. 
they do seek a two, one to two years contracted revenue, which will cover operating expenses, uh, because private equity doesn't want to come. They, they are fine to give the money, but they don't want to have capital calls afterwards. So to be honest with you, there are different strategies in this, you know, territory of private equity. Yeah. And, no, and not debt, yeah, not debt. So Mr. Mo Wingle has to find other people to make his profit. In, in fact, one of the things that we, we are interested in as we, I mean, <clears throat> while we are looking at dry bulk, we agree with many of the members on this panel that the outlook for dry bulk over the next, you know, 18 to 24 months is, is, is pretty bleak, especially on the, on the asset side. And we're actually more constructive on revenues and on rates than we are on asset values. And we would be a, a buyer or a contractor of, of, you know, we would, we would be a buyer of long-term charters at this point. It's something that we're attracted to, to the extent that it helps owners mitigate some of their concerns honing their assets. Um, I'd like to introduce, well, we have three minutes here, um, a somewhat controversial thought in a debate that we've had internally, and I think it was brought up by, by Nino, which is the concern over resales and the concern over the discrepancy. I think one of the things that happened in the, in the third and fourth quarter that we saw the difference in the secondary market is we had sellers who needed to sell. And therefore, we saw what a willing buyer and a willing seller was willing to make for price. We didn't see what a broker on 15 minutes and $150 charge was willing to put on a piece of paper for an asset value. And I think that that drove a lot of discovery in the market. And I think what we need to see now, and what is very interesting, is this thought is a lot of resale value is anchored based upon the price of steel, right? What does it cost to build a new ship? And I don't think that's the right question to ask. I think the right question to some extent is what is the, you know, we, you know, what is the price that we need in the environment to justify buying of a ship today and employing it on a long-term basis? Because as, you know, as our principal has said, we don't need to go out and build new ships. We don't need to contract yards to build new steel and put into the dry bulk market. So at what price do we need to see for people to want to take those ships that are being built and to put them on the water? And that is going to be an interesting piece of price discovery that we see over the next 18 to 24 months. Any more questions from the audience or we can wrap up? I think everybody's tired. They had a lot of private equity in these last two panels. Um, or in summary, I would say that uh, the private equity people are sometimes credit funds. So they are trying to give their money on the basis that they will get a secure return rather than wait for the upside in the form of preferred shares, I suspect. And uh, they do want contracted revenue, even if that means that one gets locked into what some owners see as low charter rates, if it is in dry bulk, if it is in tankers or uh, other ships, maybe it's a little bit easier to do so. They do look into transparency uh, and all this, of course, stuff that uh, the owners will be willing to give up to a point. And last but not least, they do look at uh, replacement values because they expect that uh, in one of the funds I deal with, they, they have invested in yards quite uh, unhappily, of course, but they, they know that what the replacement value is and they expect that there will not be too many new buildings soon. And therefore, it means that the market will feel better for the next few years in terms of supply of new, new buildings. Look at Mr. Almeida, he's a naval architect, I'm not, so. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I know the answer to that, but um, I, I, uh, I vaguely recall it had something to do with moving wine or olive oil or something, something like that. No? The very first, who built the very first ship in the world here was Athena, the goddess, you, you can look at the picture, the goddess of wisdom. 
to transport to transport what wisdom. We need we need a bit more of that in the industry. Dude. We need a few more of those ships. <laughs> we have, yeah, yeah. Yes, we have a few muse museums, as you know, nautical museums. We do, but they rely on people who have money to support them. So we need a little bit of profit somewhere to support the knowledge. By all means, so knowledge is very important. And. Uh, <laughs> 